In our previous lectures, we understood what is an algorithm and what are the characteristics of an algorithm. I hope those concepts are clear. Now let's proceed with the significance of algorithms. In this lecture, we will understand what is the significance of algorithms. Why do we write good algorithms? What is the difference between a good algorithm and a bad algorithm? All these concepts will be clear in this lecture. So let's get started and let's see what are the topics. The topic of this lecture is significance of algorithms. We will understand what is the significance of good algorithms. Let's start with this lecture. A bad algorithm can lead to longer execution time. Remember this that a bad algorithm can lead to longer execution time. What does this mean? This means that if we convert a bad algorithm to its equivalent program and if we execute that program on our system, that program will take a lot of time. It will take a lot of time to execute and give us the output. And we don't want that. Why do we want to wait for so long? So this is the meaning of a bad algorithm. When we convert a bad algorithm to its equivalent program, that specific program will take a lot of time to execute. So that is why I've written a bad algorithm can lead to longer execution time. Now let's see an example to understand this properly. Let's take a simple example of calculating the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. Let's write the algorithm for the same. First, we need to start the algorithm. This is step number one. Step number two is to initialize the variable sum to zero. We want to calculate the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. For this, we need variable sum and we are initializing it to zero. So that's the initial sum. Later, after the completion of the algorithm, we will get the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. That's what we will take care of. In order to calculate the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers, we can use loops. We can iterate from 1 to 10 to the power of 12. And with each iteration, we can add the current iteration value to the sum variable. In this way, we will get the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. Let's realize this in our algorithm. Let's write step number 3. Enter the loop that iterates from 1 to 10 to the power of 12. Now we are entering the loop that iterates from 1 to 10 to the power of 12. This means our loop will run 10 to the power of 12 times. Step number 4 is to add the current iteration value to sum. And step number 5 is to repeat steps 4 and 5 so that our loop will run 10 to the power of 12 times. In each iteration, we will add the current iteration value to sum. Initially, we know sum is 0. When we enter our loop, we will get 1 as the current iteration value and that value will be added to sum. We will get 1 in sum because initial sum is 0 and now the new sum is 0 plus 1 which is equal to 1. In the second iteration, we will get value 2 and that value will be added to the previous sum which is 1. The new sum will be 1 plus 2 which is equal to 3. After this, we will get 3 as the value from the current iteration. This 3 will be added to the sum variable which means that 3 is added to the previous sum which was 3. Now we will get the new sum as 6 because 3 plus 3 is 6. In this way, we will get the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers using the loop. Now finally, we must return the value of sum and then we can stop the algorithm. This one is a bad algorithm. Now why am I saying this algorithm is bad? You will get this in a moment. I told you already that a bad algorithm can lead to longer execution time. This means if we convert a bad algorithm to its equivalent program, that specific program will take a lot of time to execute. In order to see this, first let's convert this specific algorithm to its equivalent program. This is how the equivalent program looks like. Here, 
we are writing this function calculate sum. I'm assuming that you already know some programming language. I have written this specific code in C programming language. If you know some programming language, then understanding this program will not be difficult at all. Although I'll try to explain what I have written here. If you don't know any programming language, it's okay, but it is important to understand at least the basics of some programming language. It would be easier for you to follow along this course if you already know one programming language. If you know the basics, it would be enough. Now let's understand this calculate sum function. Within this function, I have defined variable sum and I have assigned value 0 to it. This variable is a long int variable because this variable will hold a very large value at the end. That's why we are defining it as long int. Also, we are defining variable i and this variable i is also long int type. Now after this, we have this for loop. This loop will run from 1 to 10 to the power of 12. Within this for loop, we have sum plus equal to i. This means we are adding the current iteration value to sum. This loop will run 10 to the power of 12 times. Here we have the increment step. In each iteration, this means what happens. First, i is initialized to 1. Then, this condition is checked. Is 1 less than this value? Yes. We'll proceed. We will add the current iteration value to sum which means we will add 1 to 0. We will get 1 as the result. Eventually, sum will hold 1. After this, i is incremented. This means i becomes 2. Then this condition is again checked. In this way, the loop will run a total of 10 to the power of 12 times. And in this way, we will get the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. After this, we must return the value of sum. That's what I have written here in step number 6. These three steps are equivalent to this for loop and this line, this statement is equivalent to this step. Now, we know how the equivalent program of this algorithm looks like. When we execute this program, we will not get the output immediately. We will get the output after a long time. Now, why is that the case? In order to know this, we must know what are the number of instructions that will be executed by our computer. Let's find out the number of instructions here. How many instructions will be executed by our computer? Let's calculate the number of instructions. The number of instructions is equal to 2 plus 1 plus 10 to the power of 12 into 1 plus 1 plus 1 and then plus 1. First, let's observe this statement. Here we have two instructions. We are first defining variable sum and then we are defining variable i. So these are the two instructions. That's why I have written two here. Then after this, within this for loop, we have the initialization statement. This is one instruction. Hence, I have added one here. And this will be executed only one time. But these three instructions will be executed 10 to the power of 12 times. This is how for loop works. These instructions will be executed 10 to the power of 12 times. That is why I have multiplied 1 plus 1 plus 1 by 10 to the power of 12. 1 for this instruction, 1 for this instruction, and 1 for this instruction. Finally, I have added 1 for this specific instruction. So, how many instructions are there? There are 3004 billion instructions. This means our computer needs to execute 3004 billion instructions. So now we know we have 3004 billion instructions. These many instructions need to be executed by our computer. Let us assume that a computer takes one second to execute Y instructions. And let's say y is equal to 100 million. This means that our computer takes one second to execute 100 million instructions. This one is a huge number. Within one second, our computer is capable of executing 100 million instructions. But how many instructions do we want to execute? We want to execute 
3004 billion instructions. Now we want to know how much time our computer takes to execute these many instructions. Let's calculate this. We know time to run Y instructions is equal to 1 second. We know this already from the statement that in order to execute Y instructions, our computer take 1 second. So, how much time our computer takes to execute one instruction? Let's see this. Time to run one instruction is equal to 1 by Y seconds. From Y, we want 1. How do we get 1? We need to divide this Y by Y in order to get 1. If we want to balance this equation, we need to divide this 1 by Y. And that is why we are getting 1 by Y here. So, time to run one instruction is equal to 1 by y seconds. I hope this idea is clear. Now, how much time will x instructions take? Time to run x instructions will be x by y seconds. Why is that the case? We want x here. What we have here? 1. In order to get x, we need to multiply this by x. Then only we will get x here. Similarly, in order to balance this equation, we need to multiply this by x also. And that's why we are getting x by y here. So, in order to run x instructions, our computer will take x by y seconds. This x needs to be replaced by 3004 billion instructions. So, what we will get? Time to run 3004 billion instructions will be 3004 billion instructions divided by y instructions. What is y? y is equal to 100 million. So, we need to divide 3004 billion by 100 million. Time to run 3004 billion instructions is equal to 3004 billion divided by 100 million. We will get nearly 30,000 seconds. And this is nearly equal to 500 minutes. And this is nearly equal to 8 hours. So, our computer program is taking nearly 8 hours to execute. To get the final output, this program is taking nearly 8 hours. This is the reason why when we execute this program, we will not get the output immediately we will get the output nearly after 8 hours. That is why this algorithm is bad. Why this algorithm is bad? This algorithm is bad because when we convert this algorithm to its equivalent program, its program is going to take a lot of time. It is taking nearly 8 hours to execute. Can we write an algorithm which can lead to shorter execution time? Yes, we can do this. We want to know the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. For this purpose, we can write a better algorithm. You will see this in a moment. Please note this, that a good algorithm will lead to shorter execution time. So, this is the difference between a good algorithm and a bad algorithm. A bad algorithm leads to longer execution time. On the other hand, a good algorithm leads to shorter execution time. Let's see this in action. Let's write a good algorithm to calculate the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. Let's do this. First, we're going to start our algorithm. Then, we need to initialize n to 10 to the power of 12. We are going to initialize n to 10 to the power of 12. Now, what is the next step? We will now calculate the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers through this formula. We know this formula to calculate the sum of first n natural numbers. We know that n is initialized to 10 to the power of 12. So, this formula will calculate the sum of first 10 to the power of 12 natural numbers. We just need to plug in the values here. So, instead of using a loop, we can use this formula. Now, what is the next step? The next step is to output the value of sum. And finally, we can stop the algorithm. This is a good algorithm and you will see this in a moment why is that the case. Let's convert this to its equivalent program to see this in action. How many instructions do we need to execute and eventually how much time our computer will take. Let's convert this to C program. 
like this. Again, we have the function calculate sum, but this time the logic is different. Instead of using a loop, we are using this formula n into n plus 1 divide by 2. Here we are initializing n to 10 to the power of 12 and we are defining variable sum here. And here we are calculating the sum. Finally, we are returning sum. How many instructions do we have here? Let's calculate the number of instructions. Here we have two instructions. Then we have four instructions. This is not a single instruction. Here we have four instructions. First, we are adding n and 1. This is one instruction. Then we are multiplying n by the result of n plus 1. This is one instruction. Then we are dividing n into n plus 1 by 2. This is one instruction. So there are three instructions here. Then we are assigning the result of n into n plus 1 divided by 2 to sum. This assignment is also an instruction. So there are total four instructions. And then finally we have this instruction, return sum. So we have 2 plus 4 plus 1 instructions. This is equal to 7. So the number of instructions is 7. Now let's do the same calculation. Let's find out how much time our computer program takes to execute these many instructions. We know already that in order to execute 100 million instructions, our computer takes one second. In order to execute x instructions, our computer takes x by y seconds. This time, the value of x is 7. So, how much time it will take? Time to run 7 instructions is equal to 7 divided by 100 million. And this is equal to 0 0.00000007 seconds. This is equal to 70 nanoseconds. Can you imagine this change? 70 nanoseconds. Previously, our bad algorithm was taking nearly 8 hours to execute. But the good algorithm takes 70 nanoseconds. Much, much lesser than 8 hours. Very, very fast. So, this specific algorithm, if we convert to its equivalent program, takes 70 nanoseconds. So, clearly good algorithm leads to shorter execution time. That's why we must always try to write good algorithms. And this is the reason why analysis of algorithms is needed. Why do we need to analyze our algorithms? There can be multiple algorithms to solve a problem. In order to know which algorithm is a good algorithm, we need to analyze those algorithms. We need to know how much time those algorithms will take. Now I hope it is clear what is the significance of good algorithm. So with this, we are done with this topic and this means we are done with this lecture. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. I will see you in the next one.